Welcome. Thank you for joining the Kootenai Conservation Program's Winter Webinar Series. This year, KCP's Winter Webinar Series focuses on the themes of conservation in the context of climate change, restoration in action. We are co-hosting today's webinar with the Columbia Basin Watershed Network. I'm KCP Stewardship Coordinator Adrian Shaw, and with me I have Kristen Asen, CBWN Senior Manager. We also have Nicole Trigg, KCP Communications Coordinator, ensuring that the webinar runs smoothly in the background. The Kootenai Conservation Program is a broad partnership of land and water conservation and stewardship groups, government agencies, resource industries, and agricultural producers working throughout the East and the West Kootenays. KCP has four main priorities, increase the effectiveness, collaboration, and coordination of private land securement, increase the effectiveness and coordination of stewardship activities taking place on private land, building financial and technical capacity for partner organizations, and serving as a network to achieve efficiency, synergies, and ultimately greater effectiveness. I'd like to now um, introduce um, the Columbia Basin Watershed Network Senior Manager, uh, Kristen Asen, who will introduce herself. Thanks, Adrian. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kristen Asen, the Senior Manager with the Columbia Basin Watershed Network. We work to support our members and connect them across the Columbia Basin watershed groups wanting to achieve their uh, watershed goals. We support peer-to-peer -peer learning and, and serve as a, a go-to hub for our member groups to find training, capacity, mapping program. We work with Selkirk College to support the mapping needs of watershed groups. If you visit our, our website, uh, cbwn.ca, you can read about some of our past projects, including a 3D wetland mapping we did of Bach, the Box Lake wetland last year for the Arrow Lakes Environment Stewardship Society. Our intake for the 2019 program will be open until early March. Uh, so I'll, I'll send some information a little bit later um, with the KCP follow-up today. Um, and you can also stay tuned to other activities and updates through our monthly newsletter and I'll, I'll provide that information. We would like to acknowledge that we are gathering in the traditional territories of the Sinaiq First Nation, the Tunaha Nation, and the Okanagan peoples. So um, just getting started today, before we begin Begin with our presenter, we'd like to do uh, a couple of quick polls. If you wouldn't mind just letting us know where you're based, so whether you're in the East or West Kootenays, the North Columbia, elsewhere in BC or beyond, we'll just take a couple moments to get let people get warmed up, let us know where, where you're from, uh, so we can get a little idea of who's joining us today. And uh, if anyone's just tuning in, um, we're really happy to be uh, working with the Kootenai Conservation Program to explore wetlands. We've got, um, we're celebrating uh, in February is the International World Wetlands Day. So it's a really lovely opportunity to explore the, the value and the role of, of wetlands for e ecosystem services and, and, uh, all in, in, as well as in the context of climate change mitigation. So it looks like most folks, there's a good balance between the East and West Kootenays, a few elsewhere in BC. And uh, so we'd also like to know, what is your affiliation? Are you uh, with a nonprofit, consultant, government, First Nations, student or, uh, or other? To give us a sense of, um, and yourselves a sense of, of who's joining us today. Thanks. And if you're just joining us now, welcome to the, the second winter webinar of the KCP winter webinar series and the, the first of two collaborations with the, the Columbia Basin Watershed Network. So it looks like we've got a good balance of nonprofit and consultant participants today. A few from government. Yeah. Great, thank you. So again, um, thank you for joining us. 
next, we'll, the next webinar in the series will be co-hosting with the Kootenai Conservation Program. Um, please join us uh, on February 21st to explore riparian wetland restoration in the Slocan Valley. Grégoire Lamoura from the Slocan River Streamkeepers. He'll be exploring the challenges and benefits of riparian wetland restoration. He'll let us know about his, his experiences building good relationships with landowners and some of the successes they've had with the over 40 restoration projects in the, in the Slocan Valley. So I think, thank you. Uh, back to Adrian, if you wanna let us know who's all made this possible. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Kristen. I'd just like to acknowledge our program sponsors and supporters and without them, we wouldn't be able to put on events like this. I'd like to now take the time to introduce um, the webinar information. Um, so the webinar will be approximately 45 minutes with up to 15 minutes for questions at the end. As an audience member, you are on mute and will be on mute for the duration of the presentation so that we don't have distracting background noise or feedback. If you're not familiar with the Zoom platform, take a moment to locate your control panel by hovering your mouse over the bottom of the screen. You can adjust your video layout between active speaker view, presenter, or gallery view, the presentation. Enter any questions you have in the Q&A box and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. If you have any technical issues, please put your questions, comments in the chat box and the KCP communication coordinator, Nicole Trigg, will monitor the chat and will do her best to help you. The webinar will be recorded and made available on our website. So I'd like to introduce everyone to Neil Fletcher. He has a broad range of experience regarding resource management, previously working for a watershed authority in Ontario, the Canadian Forest Service and BC Hydro. Over the last nine years with the BCWF, he has focused most of his efforts on wetland related issues within BC. And since this time, he's delivered over a hundred workshops or events to broad range of participants. Many of these have involved hands-on restoration. He is the chair of Wetland Stewardship Partnership of BC, a multi-agency partnership that focus on provincial priorities and is currently working on standardizing a provincial wetland inventory within the province. So welcome, Neil. I pass uh, the screen sharing on to you if you'd like to load your presentation. Great, thank you very much. And here we go. Excellent. I'm assuming everybody can see my screen and thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm Neil Fletcher with the BC Wildlife Federation and let's make sure this, uh, I just want to thank uh, both the, the co-hosts for, for having me here today and uh, I just wanted to uh, I guess start by saying that uh, I was invited to come and talk about wetland restoration in the Kootenays. And for this presentation, given that there's, there's quite an interest in private land, a lot of the examples that I'll be providing are some of our restoration projects on private land. Uh, so first of all, uh, wetlands are amazing places. They're some of my favorites to be around. Uh, it's where water and soil uh, interact and create unique vegetation on the landscape and and these environments are, are really important for a lot of different wildlife species that we have around the province. Uh, being part of the BC Wildlife Federation our, our key interest is in seeing uh, healthy habitats uh, around the province for wildlife. Um, this photo is something I took this summer it's about a one square meter of, uh, of some exposed soils near a wetland up north and as you can see there's lots of wildlife using the site. We have bear, deer and moose all within about a square meter. Uh, so, so wetlands do attract a lot of uh, our wildlife species to them. Uh, about 600 species around BC are associated with wetlands for part of their life needs and about a third of species at risk require them uh, 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 during their, at some point within their life. Um, but not only uh, are wetlands important for wildlife, but communities are becoming increasingly aware of the other values that are associated with them. Uh, this is a wetland that was created 
uh, by the this lumber mill in the background there uh, to clean water before it left their site. They were uh, uh, they were getting uh, reports of having uh, polluted water leaving their site, so this was a solution for them to to cleaning and treating their water uh, prior to uh, entering uh, nearby streams. Uh, wetlands are also these great uh, uh, sponges on the landscape. They can capture and hold water uh, within our watersheds and then slowly release them uh, throughout the year to help moderate stream flow uh, as well as uh, recharge our groundwater. Now just in the last year we've had a couple of really big reports come out about the value of wetlands. The Insurance Bureau of Canada has been calling for the urgent action of protecting wetlands, realizing that a lot of the insurance claims that have been happening in the last decade have been water-related issues. Um, and in BC, in Grand Forks, uh, Council has decided that they're going to buy out about 100 homes. Uh, you may have heard of the flooding that happened last year. Uh, within the floodplain, and they're going, and the the goal is to restore that area back to uh, natural habitat, back to floodplain and, and wetland habitat. Uh, there are a number of different uh, values associated with wetlands, and 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 wetlands function and provide a lot of services to our communities for free. Uh, this is a list of of things that are associated to some of the the values and functions that we derive from from wetlands. And economists like to put numbers behind the value of, of those, those functions and services. And just uh, a portion of the functions that we're showing on this slide here have been tabulated uh, from uh, various economists. And, and the range can be quite, quite large between minimum and maximum. But in relative to other e ecosystem types, wetlands do come up often uh, up higher than many other ecosystems in terms of the values per hectare uh, of, of services that they're providing to our communities. And one of the key points here is that wetlands are not wastelands. They have tremendous value for both our society and for wildlife. Now, unfortunately, over uh, the last hundred years or so, uh, we have not been so nice to the wetlands that we uh, that we have within uh, Canada and, and abroad and uh, we've lost a lot of them for using them for other services or other or other purposes and uh, uh, one of the other studies that came out last year was a, a global report on uh, wetland the state of wetlands ar around the world and uh, some of the some of the key uh, findings was that wetlands are being lost at about three times the rate of forests and we've lost about 35% in the last 45 years globally. And the story around BC is, is quite similar. Uh, in the lower mainland, we've, we've had tremendous loss where we've had urban development. This is uh, near where I live. You can see uh, the light blue is where wetlands used to be on the landscape. Uh, the red is where the fresh water still occur and purple is uh, our salt water estuaries that still occur. Uh, in the Okanagan, the light pink is where wetlands used to be on the landscape, and you can see that they coincide with a lot of where we've developed our communities uh, within the Okanagan. And uh, the dark purple, which is a much lesser extent, is where wetlands still remain on the landscape. And then when we go over to the Kootenays, uh, so your region, uh, the set that I have around, around that is related to the impacts from reservoir creation and the watersheds that have those reservoirs. Uh, we've, we've found that just from the flooding alone of those reservoirs, uh, we've lost about 50% of our wetlands um, due to uh, inundation. But uh, so that's a, that's a pretty big loss within uh, the Columbia area. Um, but it's not just uh, from hydroelectric or uh, reservoir creation where we've, we've lost wetlands, but also uh, from agricultural uh, drainage. So here's a, a converted wetland that uh, was almost a small lake that had uh, been drained at the turn of the century, uh, as well as fill. This is some fill of uh, a wetland where people used to fish and uh, is now uh, in the center of uh, Selmo. Some will be seen. 
Now, if you look at uh, who uh, our, our regulations and our legislation, uh, the the burden of protecting and conserving our water resources lies within the province of BC. Uh, however, if uh, if you were to speak to, to many of the great people that do work for the province, uh, it is a challenging task to manage uh, that water resources. And uh, I guess the question is, can we assume that they're going to be protecting them for the interests of all our communities? And, and really the answer is no, I don't think they can do it alone. And, and really it's communities that need to demonstrate and explain on why wetlands are important. And so we all play a role in protecting and conserving wetlands. And, and so it, it's great to have uh, organizations uh, such as KCP and the Columbia Basin Watershed Network who can bring people together uh, to be those stewards of the land. Uh, as far as the BC Wildlife Federation uh, is concerned, uh, we, we put together a wetlands program back in 1996. And ultimately our goal is to raise awareness about the importance of wetlands and, and build community capacity among a community of stewards. Um, when we do work in the Columbia area, one of our, uh, one of our key reports that we, we look at for guidance on, on where we should be prioritizing our efforts comes from the Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program's Riparian and Wetland Action Plan. And uh, in that plan, they identify areas within the Columbia basin uh, where there are still intact wetlands and where uh, there is opportunity to conserve and protect these ones. Uh, so these are these are the areas in pink, the, the darker pink, this slide are, are focal areas for doing wetland restoration and conservation work for the Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program. Um, and over the last few years we've we've really focused a lot of our efforts. You can see a lot of the locations where we've host, hosted workshops and events have coincided quite well with uh, locations where there are priorities for, for this region. Um, just a, a snapshot of our program, every year we, we engage with a, a number of people through workshops and outreach and uh, I figure between 1,500 and 2,500 people a year in BC uh, we're engaging with. And this doesn't, these aren't likes on Facebook, these aren't likes on Instagram, these are, these are interactions and that we have with, uh, with people where we're, we're hoping to engage with them, uh, either to build their awareness around wetlands or get them out into the field, uh, exploring them and, and learning about how important these systems are. And so um, for us, it's, it's a, the engagement is about connecting people to the resource and um, enhancing their capacity to uh, to both appreciate it, but also to to steward it. And uh, through that, uh, we might cover things like inventory, so how to do wetland inventory, or we might be working on new wetland health assessments. Uh, here we are with Jacob Delise, who uh, had uh, brought. Uh, Paul Hansen, uh, who presented, I believe, last year at one of these webinars on uh, uh, doing health assessment around wetlands. We've also hosted workshops on uh, uh, wetland mapping using tools like QGIS. And uh, of course, uh, wetland restoration uh, has been a topic that we've, we've often uh, provided as, as far as uh, training for people that want to do wetland restoration. And uh, through that, we've had uh, a number of uh, great people come through our program and do some uh, really amazing things. Uh, now, in the, in the Columbia, I just wanted to point out that there are some really great and amazing people, and I only have a few here that I can sh share today, that uh, have come through our workshops or that we've had the privilege to work with and partner with, who are great assets in the Columbia region to do uh, wetland stewardship. Uh, here's Nelson Wright, he's a city planner with uh, the district of Sparwood and has been involved in a couple of wetland restoration projects uh, in, in and around Sparwood. Uh, here's Irene Manley, we've been partnering with her for the last few years and, and Irene's been a force to be reckoned with as far as all the, the various conservation lands that she's helped lined up to do uh, wetland uh, restoration projects. Uh, Jerry Nelson in, in Selmo, uh, uh, Jerry ha is uh, 
director of the Streamkeepers Group, and he's identified a number of a wetland, potential wetland sites uh, in the Salmo River Valley, uh, partnering with private landowners to do uh, wetland restoration projects on their land. Um, the Slocan, uh, the Slocan uh, Valley has a really great network of people. Uh, here's a couple, uh, Margaret Hartley and, and Ryan Durand uh, in this photo here. They're looking at a wetland at uh, Little Slocan Lake. Uh, they've been involved in uh, a, a multi-year project to assess wetlands all throughout the Slocan uh, watershed and uh, through that uh, have, have convened a number of individuals to work together on, on identifying priority areas and uh, through that uh, they're informing both uh, further conservation of wetlands within the Slocan Valley as well as informing uh, future restoration projects. And so uh, some of the work they're doing is really, really great. Uh, here's Gregoire Lamoureux. He's going to be our, your next webinar presenter. Gregoire has uh, worked with us, and we're really uh, a big fan of the work that he does, so we're looking forward to his webinar. Uh, but uh, another great resource uh, within the, the Kootenai area. Uh, Lawrence Redfern, uh, he's a Fish and Game Club member out of Castlegar. We worked with him on a, a wetland project at a school. Uh, in Kennard, and uh, this year he's going to be creating another wetland at uh, the Robson uh, School just outside of Castlegar uh, to uh, create a, a wetland for for students to uh, get out into the field and, and do restoration or be involved in the restoration but also have an outdoor classroom afterwards. And uh, I believe this is the last example, uh, Rachel Rousseau and, and Eva Cameron who uh, have identified a number of projects in the Rosslyn area uh, and we'll be partnering with them again this year on, on a couple more and uh, they've uh, been really great at uh, uh, building capacity and interest for doing projects in, in that uh, in that area. So here's one that uh, Eva had uh, helped identify in your Rosslyn Secondary School. Uh, there's some of the design work and some before and afters of uh, a small wetland restoration project right in the middle of the city. Um, when we started getting involved in private land work, uh, I wasn't quite sure if there would be much of an appetite to pay for property owners to restore wetlands on their own property. Um, to, some, to some people, they think of that as being a, a landscape upgrade. But uh, I want to talk a bit about uh, our, our work in, in and around private land and, and why we we do it. Uh, this is Alex Berland and Judy Morton. They were the first landowners that we had worked with on doing wetland restoration on private land. And um, what had happened was on their site, they had a, a beaver dam that uh, blew out uh, due to uh, uh, some flooding uh, where the, the beaver dam had been uh, abandoned by the beaver. And uh, here you can see where there's a head cut uh, forming through the through the dam and uh, we ended up getting some funding to patch up the area to save the wetland that was behind their uh, behind the dam and uh, here's a bottom photo shows the, the area of wetland that was protected or uh, retained from from doing that work but this is this attracts a lot of waterfowl as well as uh, amphibians and uh, it was one of the first projects that we started doing on private land and uh, uh, since then we've, we've had a, a number of restoration projects around the Kootenai so here's a an image of pins of uh, sites where we've done work and the orange are the ones that we did in 2018 we had eight projects last year uh, the yellow are, are po previous projects we've we've worked on uh, both private land and uh, public lands, and then the green are ones that are on our books to do this coming year. Uh, as far as uh, uh, the BC Wildlife Federation is concerned, our, our, the ha number of hectares we've restored has really ramped up in the last few years, and, and this is reflective of some, some funding that has come into play. Uh, there was a five-year period where we had funding from the National Wetland Conservation Fund, but we have had secured 
other funding to do work on private land. Um, if uh, I have to recognize both Tom Biebighauser and Robin Ann's child, who do a lot of the consulting work uh, and field supervision planning around a lot of our restoration projects, both within the Kootenays and other parts of BC. Uh, but without these two individuals, I would we would not be able to do all the restoration projects that uh, that we've been involved in. Um, Tom is uh, is. Uh, uh, a leader in, in restoration around North America. He's, he's restored over 2,000 wetlands and uh, has also authored uh, a couple of books, including this one here, Wetland Restoration and Construction, the Technical Guide. And so uh, definitely if you're interested in, in restoration techniques, this is a really great resource for, for anybody uh, that wants to learn more about that. Uh, a couple of the projects we did this past year, um, Sparrowhawk Farms, uh, uh, was about a, about a three hectare uh, wetland area in the areas of red or where we had created some new wetlands. You can see some old drainage lines of, of where water had been uh, pulled off the site. And uh, with the, at that site, uh, two, uh, two species at risk that we were targeting are, are both the American badger who uh, we, we found will use some of the spoil piles of our, our restoration projects, and uh, northern leopard frog, which have been reintroduced uh, in fairly close proximity to, to the site uh, at Sparrowhawk Farm. Uh, another uh, restoration on private land was the, the haywire, uh, haywire Farm near Fruitvale, and uh, you can see the blue areas are where we had done some, some uh, excavation. And uh, these were, these were, this was an old area that was, they tried to farm and uh, uh, they abandoned farming it because uh, it was too wet and uh, uh, they decided they'd want to give some of this back to nature. So uh, here's a, an example at Haywire Farm of what the site looked like before. And then during construction, you can see the equipment working on the site, uh, reconfiguring the soils and the topography. Uh, these photos are taken from Robin. And uh, you can see some some woody debris had been added in, and it's uh, you know when you when you're trying to show photos from this year, it's hard to see exactly uh, what the end result will look like. So I have a photo of a similar project. This is Salix and Sedge Farm near Salmo. Uh, we had done uh, the previous year, uh, so this is before and after. Uh, uh, are doing some of the restoration work. You can see the hydrologies come back in. This is about three months after uh, going into the site and, and uh, reconfiguring the topography and, and getting the hydrology back into the site. Uh, and then uh, another project that we did last year was near Golden. Uh, the blue areas are where uh, uh, pools or ponds were excavated and the green areas are where we've raised the field so then uh, the farmers or, and the, the people that own the land can cultivate uh, the property. So in many of our private landowner sites, uh, we've aimed for a win-win where there's uh, both uh, benefit to wildlife, but also to the property owners. So in this case, a lot of the spoil piles will be uh, turned into agrarian species, but then at the same time, uh, we're gaining a better and improved wildlife habitat at the same time. So uh, I had mentioned that, um, uh, that working on private land is something that's a bit new and, and, and sometimes people ask about, you know, well, why would, why would we invest on private land? There's a couple of reasons. One is that a lot of where we, we live is where we've lost a lot of our wetlands. Uh, uh, Nancy Newhouse had mentioned this last year. People in wildlife are looking for the same places to live. Uh, so these warmer, uh, these warmer valley bottoms. And uh, that's where historically we've had a lot of impacts from draining and filling. And uh, when it comes to uh, the need to get buy-in from the community is a lot easier on private land where you're dealing with largely one proponent as opposed to public lands where you, you might have to, it might take a number of years to get the buy-in required to do a project. So there is actually, effort-wise, it can be a lot easier to work on, uh, on private lands. Um, 
Now, last year when we, we uh, or a couple of years ago, I had hosted a similar webinar and during that webinar we had asked participants if they thought we should be financially supporting restoration on private land and respondents uh, primarily said yes, 94% said yes. And uh, although we, we figured that was pretty, a pretty biased uh, group of people to ask, uh, I did pull this study out of Saskatchewan where uh, the public uh, was was asked around a similar question, and uh, and they about eighty one percent agreed or strongly agreed that society has an obligation to help landowners preserve wetlands on their land. So I think that coincides quite well. That uh, primarily, largely speaking, uh, there's an agreement that uh, you know we it might be land that's owned by somebody else, but uh, us us providing support to create habitat or wildlife or wetlands is is not necessarily a bad thing. So some of you might be interested and you might have a parcel of land that you're thinking about and might say, well, how do, how do I get my, uh, my property on the radar and seeing if it might be a, a candidate for doing restoration? Uh, so I've put together this little uh, sequence of, of how we normally go about selecting sites to do restoration. First of all, uh, we talk to the, the landowners about the site they have in, in particular and we find out if it's even a feasible uh, project to do. This might involve a site visit and uh, doing a bit of design work. And around the same time, we would uh, be wanting to look at uh, if there's any ar archaeological interests or values on the property. Um, if there are, if there's high archaeological values, that can uh, slow down the project as far as uh, the costs that might be required to doing any uh, digging or excavation. To other potential projects that might be on our list and uh, we'd also require that the, the landowner sign a stewardship agreement with us uh, that uh, lays out our, our obligations and their obligations in the project. We would uh, then need to secure funding through grants or other sources and also um, uh, complete any permitting that might be required to do the works. After that, uh, there would be a competitive bidding pro process to do the physical work. So this would be uh, bringing on the heavy equipment to, to do uh, a lot of the punching in of the hydrology. And then, uh, and then the restoration works would uh, be carried out with either Tom or Robin or another consultant or specialist. And then, uh, and then after that, there would be monitoring and adaptive management of anything that might need to be done. So. Uh, that's, that's pretty much the flow of how uh, we go about doing projects. Um, as far as our preferred sites, uh, we're looking for sites that used to be wetlands and that are degraded. Uh, we, we don't like to go into sites that are in really good condition. So if they have 100% native species, we definitely question if we could do any ecological lift at the site. Uh, we do consider things like connectivity to their surrounding landscape. If you're in the middle of, say, Nelson, uh, you'd probably have less connectivity than if you were uh, adjacent to a forest or a, a stream where wildlife can access the site. And, 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 and uh, so we think about the benefits that way. Um, if there are target species or uh, species at risk that uh, we could benefit from the project, that's something we take into consideration. And uh, understanding the landowner's uh, values and core values is really important to us as far as knowing if they align with the ecological values of, of what we're hoping to achieve. And, uh, and then also uh, the cost per ecological outcome. So what are the costs of the project and, and are, they, are they justifiable uh, for the, the for what we can get out of it. Uh, we do look, consider more low risk sites. So if you were wanting to build a dam above a community, I think that that'd be a pretty high risk uh, project. But uh, so we, we are risk adverse. We try to pick low risk projects. And um, if the landowner can bring anything in terms of either funding or even in-kind support to the project, that helps us leverage uh, the funding that we might be able to bring to the table to do the project. So those are some considerations and I'd, I'd say that 
if, if, if it's us or other partners or uh, project proponents that are doing the work, uh, these are it's going to be similar considerations that they would have as well. Um, we have put together a stewardship agreement, and uh, a number of years ago, we had a uh, we we had uh, a lawyer help us craft this and really uh, put it in some, some language that, uh, that would suit both our needs and the investment that we're making on the private land uh, owner's site. Uh, so one of the things that this does is it, uh, it clarifies the roles of both ourselves and, and the owner, and uh, it, it provides a, a sense of security for the investment, uh, both to ourselves and to the, our funders who help uh, fund these projects. Uh, we have put together a, 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 a primer on wetland restoration on private land. It's about an eight page document uh, that we can offer uh, electronically uh, or to groups. And uh, we're, not, uh, we're not really uh, competitive here. We're, we're happy to share this with other groups that might want to, uh, to be involved in, in restoration. And, and really for us uh, to know that there's projects going on uh, we don't necessarily need to be the lead. We just like to know that uh, we can support either or uh, other groups that are, are doing this work as well. Uh, but uh, changing the, the conversation to having private landowners uh, get engaged in this type of work can be really helpful. And, uh, and we're happy to play whatever role we can. Um, this past year, uh, we had uh, been asked by Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation, if we would be willing to monitor and evaluate uh, sites that we've been involved in for doing restoration around uh, BC. And uh, the key question that they were asking was, uh, what are the benefits to wildlife of these restoration projects? And can, how, do we, um, how do we know that they're being successful? Uh, now, uh, for anybody who's ever had a grant in the past, you'll you'll realize that uh, most of the time, uh, the funders are, are, are mostly interested in the shovel in the ground uh, phase of a project, and, and very few are willing to, to fund monitoring and assessment work. So we are, we are very uh, fortunate that we could look at a number of our sites around BC and do uh, a bit of a study. This past year, uh, we got the funding in June, and uh, so the, the, what we could focus on was the vegetation uh, of the sites and uh, look at the plant communities uh, that were at these sites. This is a uh, this is an overview of the uh, of, of of a number of the sites around the southern part of BC that we had uh, we sent botanists to, and as well as some of our staff to do some uh, preliminary evaluations. And so at, at each of these sites. Uh, we had a number of plots, vegetation plots, that were randomly put throughout uh, the site. And uh, through that, um, we were taking measures of uh, post-restoration as well as uh, a proxy baseline, so like a proxy pre-restoration site. So we would we'd select sites that were nearby uh, that represented what the site may have uh, mostly looked like prior to us going in and doing restoration. And uh, one of the, uh, Evan I think is on a uh, participant today. Uh, so uh, Evan helped us with all of our Kootenai work on, on doing the, the uh, plant surveys and had did a, a really great job uh, compiling a, a ton of data for us uh, related to uh, the plants both in our restored stored sites as well as our proxy sites uh, for the Kootenai area. And then two other botanists for other parts of BC were involved in the project. Um, what we found overall uh, is that uh, in the uh, aquatic section, so both the aquatic and, and marsh sections of our area, which were primarily our target for the restoration projects, we had a really good response as far as native species establishment. So after restoration, 88% uh, native species cover, uh, relative uh, cover, uh, versus 31% uh, pre-restoration 
of the sites that were being selected. This is on average across all of BC, uh, but uh, what this demonstrates is that within the target area that we were looking at, so the aquatic and marsh zones, uh, we had really good um, a response as far as the native species that were colonizing the sites. Um, where we had some challenges was more in some of the up the, the spoil piles that uh, were left on site and that's something that uh, we'll be working with uh, in the future is is seeing how we can deal with the more upland areas that uh, in some cases uh, got pretty weedy but as far as our target areas of creating wetlands uh, the native species response in those areas was quite high so we were able to demonstrate some some decent uh, ecological lift at these sites from a plant community perspective. Um, now this is uh, one of the last little sessions of the, the slide I just wanted to go over and, and the presentation is going to end uh, fairly soon. There still should be about 10 minutes for, for questions. Uh, but I did want to talk about a story up in, in Meadow Creek. Uh, this is Terry and Michelle Haller and they were one of the first one of the first uh, uh, private landowners we worked with and uh, very willing to let us come onto their land and, and make quite a few changes right around their house. And uh, uh, they had, uh, uh, here's, a, here's a photo of some of the work we had done in the first year. You can see where there's been some new plantings put up. And uh, we also worked on uh, some bat, bat boxes and, and uh, bird boxes as well uh, at their site. And uh, this past year, Michelle gave me uh, a number of photos. Michelle's an amazing photographer. And uh, she shared with me a number of photos of wildlife that are, are using the wetlands that were restored there. And we're hoping in, in future years, after we get some monitoring done, uh, we'll be able to, to uh, share some, some stats on uh, the value for, to wildlife. But uh, in the meantime, they wanted to share with you some of the photos that Michelle took at uh, her property, uh, really stunning uh, photos of amphibians breeding, uh, uh, dragonflies uh, using the site, so some healthy aquatic uh, insects, uh, ungulate species using the site. Uh, there's bald eagles and northern harriers hunting around their wetlands, shorebirds using their sites. Two weeks after the, the site was restored, we had uh, trumpeter swans fly in and they found the wetland right away. So uh, what I'm trying to demonstrate is that the, the wildlife response to these sites has been tremendous. Uh, breeding mergansers, successfully breeding mergansers, successfully breeding American coots, more shorebirds using uh, the edges of the wetland, uh, blue-winged teal, more ungulates. These photos are really incredible. I do have to thank Michelle for having so many great photos. And this is the benefit. Another benefit of private landowners is if uh, is that they're on the land the entire time and can really share a lot of what they're seeing uh, for attracting wildlife. So the photo on the top is from a helicopter of Terry and Michelle's property. You can see their home on the far left and then all the wetlands that were created around their, their house. Uh, so really they've, they've attracted a lot of, of wildlife right around where they live. And uh, the bottom image is in yellow are all the, the ponds that were created as part of that project, which took over a course of a couple years. Now, uh, they, were, they were the first and they were the uh, early adopters of, of uh, for this community and in, in bringing people on board and saying, you know, wetlands are important, wildlife is important, and we, we get it, we understand that story. And they really flew the flag for us as far as, as talking about conservation and being that, uh, that community champion. After that, we, we had a couple of open houses and uh, the neighbors, uh, two of the adjacent neighbors saw what was happening uh, and uh, asked if we could do work on their property as well. Uh, so both uh, two private landowners as well as the Nature Trust of BC uh, shortly afterwards followed up with some additional restoration projects on their properties as well. And uh, so this, this really demonstrates the value 
and uh, the contagious nature of getting involved in wetland projects. Um, and uh, this image here, I just wanted to share with you, is from one of the neighboring properties. This is about a half hectare size wetland. And if you look really close at this image, you can see these little ducks in the water. In this one image, I've counted 60 ducks within uh, this half hectare wetland. So when we ask the question of what is the value of, the, of wetland creation for wildlife, uh, here we're able to demonstrate it with these photos. And uh, I'm hoping uh, this year, if we're successful with some funding, we'll also do some additional monitoring of these sites. Now, I had mentioned that uh, a lot of this work has happened through a number of funders. We've been fortunate to work with uh, a number of funders on doing work on private land. And uh, these are some of the key, uh, key funders who've helped us over the years to do uh, restoration projects. Columbia Basin Trust, Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program, Wildlife Habitat Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada, Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation, and the Government of British Columbia. Uh, lastly, if you are interested in some of our workshops, we host workshops for free, uh, thanks to funding that we receive. Uh, and uh, the ones coming up in the Kootenai region include Rosslyn Wetland Keepers. Sometime in July, we haven't fixed the date exactly. Uh, so that's a two and a half day workshop over a weekend. And then uh, we're also hosting our institute, which is a seven day workshop. Uh, you would be asked to come with a project and uh, you, you apply to, to come to that one. Uh, again, it's, it's free, except uh, you, you cover your own meal and accommodations. And uh, the dates for that are September 30th to October 6th. Uh, that's it. That's our presentation. I hope that was somewhat informative for you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, I'll start with a few questions. Robin and Tom for all your wetland designs. We, I've, I've done designs as well, or we've had other uh, partners. We've, we've had a lot of different um, arrangements over the years. I would say that there are the primary ones that we've worked with, but uh, I'm open to working with others. And I've, I've mentioned a few other groups that are doing uh, restoration as well, restoration design work. Um, and we also, I, I mean, a lot of the participants or partners that we've worked with in the past uh, might be also involved in wetland design. So uh, I would say that uh, primarily Tom and Robin, but uh, we have had other arrangements as well. Great, thank you. The next question is, have you done projects that required remediation from contamination? Not, no, N not uh, to any large degree. Um, we uh, that's part of our risk adverse uh, component. So if we know there's uh, uh, heavily polluted areas, uh, there's other there's other factors to take into consideration as far as like who's going to be required to do that work. And uh, and and for us uh, at this point, we've been focusing mostly on low risk sites. <laughs> Great, thank you. The next question is, have you had landowners who did not like the outcomes of wetland restoration? We've had, um, well, I think the landowners that we work with, we, we try to be selective of ones that understand the, the purpose of what we're trying to do. Um, the, we, we have had landowners come to us and ask us for trout ponds or fishing holes or, or swimming holes and things like that. And that, that might not align as closely to our desire to create wetlands for habitat. And so uh, part of the screening process is we want to make sure that we're aligning with landowners who uh, are, uh, have a similar um, objective as, as we do. Uh, so, and then, uh, you know, if there are any issues, we try to ensure that we have uh, the capacity to, to address any of those issues on site. Thank you. The next question is, are there maintenance responsibilities for landowners? Yeah, it, I think um, 
what we've found with a lot of the sites is that uh, there is maintenance issues that come up and uh, it relates to uh, the invasive species that might uh, might come in or noxious noxious weeds that might come in for us it's it's challenging to get to them uh, after uh, our funding runs out and uh, uh, I, so there, there might be the the need for the, for the landowners to pay attention to that. So we try to work with them where we can, or to raise more funding to help them out. Um, but uh, I think it is something to be aware of that if you are going in with heavy equipment, that uh, there's going to be some exposed soils, and there might be some weed issues for uh, some years uh, to follow uh, that need to be kept on top of and. Um, and uh, ideally, we're working with partners who have some capacity to, to take care of those or help us out at least with that. The next question is, how do you ensure the wetland is retained if the property is sold? Does the agreement become registered to the land title? No, uh, for us, we haven't gone that route. Um, what we found is um, uh, we, we, we have a middle solution. So there are um, there's more stringent uh, things like putting things on title, uh, and uh, what we found is that uh, the, the, I mean the landowners we've been with we haven't had any flip yet, uh, so that's that's been good. Um, there is a risk, obviously, um, uh, in that investment for that reason, but uh, we've also found that a, a lot of landowners are reluctant uh, to to do. Uh, to, to go that route and, and go for those uh, those uh, more secure type of uh, arrangements. Um, there are definitely th those options. They still exist and some landowners will. Uh, we were trying to find a middle ground that would get our foot in the door into a lot of, onto a lot of private land. And uh, for the most part, uh, I would say that 95% of the, the properties we've been on, we haven't had any issues uh with uh the projects uh on a, on occasion there's been uh, a couple of landowners that might infringe a bit on the on the wetland but overall uh having the signed stewardship agreement has been a, a useful tool and uh it uh has served us pretty well um do, doing a greater securement or purchases at what what we found talking to some partners is that there isn't as big of an appetite for that, and uh, we were trying to find that solution that was more middle ground. Great, thank you. The next question is: What is the average timeline for a project from the initial screening phase to completion of a new wetland? So I would I would say uh, minimum would be a year uh, from when we first hear about a project to when we can do work. Um, it's probably more like a year and a half to two years, and it really depends on the project itself. But uh, uh, bear in mind that uh, all the funding that we get for these projects is grant related. So we would have to uh, first ha have the, the project designed uh, and then uh, go for that funding, which can take about a year to secure. So that's probably as quick as a turnaround as we could have, and then it's probably more like a two year period. Thanks. The next question is, how do you help convert the mosquito adverse neighbors? Uh, yeah. Um, for these types of projects where we're creating these shallow open water bodies, uh, where you can see these, a lot of them are there. It's, uh, you have these pools of water. Uh, what we've found is that they don't attract very many mosquitoes in comparison to other types of wetlands. Um, so they, they are, if there are mosquitoes that are coming in, they're, all, uh, they're competing with a number of other uh, aquatic invertebrates uh, that pr prey on mosquitoes. So uh, dragonfly larvae uh, and amphibians, uh, uh, birds, uh, the types of these shallow water wetlands tend to uh, create a really healthy environment of things that will eat mosquitoes. Mosquitoes do really well in water that uh, is uh, temporary and doesn't allow for other 
uh, aquatic invertebrates to, to establish. Uh, so they, you'll get a lot of mosquito problems in very temporary uh, water bodies where the, it might only be a three week window where there's water on the surface. Um, but if there's uh, more consistent uh, water bodies, uh, that tends to be that they might check in, they won't check out because there's, there's a, a healthy uh, diversity of other species that are uh, going to be eating them. If uh, you look at mosquito larvae, they, they're really bad swimmers. Um, they basically just stay in the water column going up and down uh, throughout the day, wriggling up and down because they, they uh, and they're, they're easy prey for any other uh, species that might uh, be on the scene to, to eat them. So what we found is uh, uh, those neighbors who uh, have concerns, they notice uh, uh, for the projects that have occurred uh, that th the new wetlands that are created are not the source of uh, mosquito issues. Um, and I, I, I've heard this from, from landowners that we've worked with. Uh, they've said, yeah, like we, we've had less mosquitoes on our property. Our neighbors were complaining, but uh, we're, we're not seeing any uh, signs of any additional mosquitoes. And, and in fact, sometimes they're saying we're finding less because of all the other species that we've attracted to our sites. Next question is, what is or are your biggest challenges in implementing wetland restoration projects in the Kootenays? Mm. Uh, I think that uh, we've had a lot of interest in, in doing work on uh, on private land and uh, the, I think one of, well, I guess one of the, the, the challenges that we're facing now is, is for some of the maintenance, we, we do want to ensure that uh, we're having good native species cover. I had mentioned that the, some of the upland areas, uh, we, at this point, we're, we're, we're trying to identify uh, local uh, companies that will be able to help uh, doing with some of the maintenance afterwards so that we take a bit of a, a pressure off of the landowners themselves to do that work. And so uh, we've been looking at uh, both the forestry companies and other uh, landscaping companies that can help with that aspect of the post, uh, the post hydrology or disturbance component, um, just so that we have a good foothold on, on some of the weedy uh, components of our sites. Aside from that, um, Telling somebody that their site isn't a good can candidate for restoration is never fun, but um, uh, there's, there's lots of factors that go into that. Um, but uh, we have a lot of really great partners that we've been working with. And, uh, uh, and I guess the lastly would be maybe just, uh, you know, funding is limited, so we can't do all the projects that we want to every year. Uh, so we have, to, we have to pick and choose the ones that are going to have the greatest uh, benefit. And the next question is, have you been involved with projects where the AOA has altered project design? Uh, to a degree, it, we've had a couple projects this, uh, this past year where uh, we've, we've had uh, archaeological assessments done and we've been asked to stay out of certain areas uh, on the site uh, that would be potentially have higher, uh, higher archaeological values or potential. And, uh, in many cases, we've been able to avoid those areas, and uh, that is that has been pretty good. Um, I do know of a project that we were working on, not in the Kootenays, but in another area, and uh, there was some some really good artifacts coming out of that site, and we ended up uh, our partners who were working on the project ended up just canceling the wetland project because. Uh, they were finding some really great artifacts and we didn't want to disturb the site any further. So unfortunately, uh, we had to pull out of uh, doing that project and, and that's, that's, that's part of it. There's lots of values on the landscape that we're, we're, we're wanting to ensure that uh, we're balancing and in, in that case, the, the balance was to, uh, to, to, to walk away from that project. Great, thank you, Neil. Um, I think we might go over just a couple minutes here. I just have one more question that I'd like to get in before we wrap up. Um, is there a minimum size for private restoration sites you will consider? When we started, we were doing all sorts of sizes of restoration. Um, I, would, I would say that there is, uh, 
I'm leaning towards putting a cap on the minimum uh, just because uh, the there is sort of a fixed cost for any project uh, as far as uh, all the administration that goes in behind the scenes and we do want to have projects that are uh, of higher value uh, a half he he half hectare is it might be where we where we land uh, we but that said I mean a lot of the schoolyard wetlands that we do they're a lot smaller than a half hectare uh, and then we, we we balance that off by the the, the value that that has within the community. So in, in at schoolyard wetlands, um, the benefit isn't just about wildlife, but it's also about connecting children and youth and the public to wetlands. And so we that's that helps offset uh, the size. And, and then we, you know, I, in those cases, we justify the project as being smaller because of the tremendous value it has to uh, that community. So I think it, it depends on the project size, size, but that's something we would factor in. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for presenting today, Neil. That was a really informative and great presentation. We had a lot of comments of people saying thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone else for joining us today in our webinar. Um, please expect a follow-up email tomorrow with a link to an online post-webinar survey with just seven questions. You might also see it at the end of this webinar as well. We appreciate your feedback as it will help us plan future webinars. Just so you know, our next webinar is Repairing a Wetland Restoration in the Slocan Valley, and that will be on Thursday, February 21st, the same time, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And a reg registration link will be included in our follow-up email. Um, we also will have CBWN's contact information, Neil's contact information with the BC Wildlife Federation, and um, you can get in touch with them at any time. Again, thank you for joining us. I hope to see you next time.